What's happening, everybody? Welcome into a brand new Crossed Up. Anthony Sanfilippos here on Bob Wankel. Phillies take two of three against the New York Mets this weekend. It was not easy. Uh, and in fact, it was an ugly start on Friday night. And we will certainly talk about that ugly start. But uh, hard not to come away from this weekend feeling uh, good about a lot of things with the Phillies talk about resilience you could talk about Bryce Harper getting his power stroke back you could talk about Christopher Sanchez uh just really being awesome uh on Sunday to, to help them win the series and then contributions from guys at the bottom of this roster that they just continue to get like the Buddy Kennedys and Cal Stevensons of the world uh good weekend Anthony five is the magic number to win the NL East for the first time since 2011 so positive vibes coming into this show yeah, I mean, and they should be, Bob. I mean, look, you knew the Mets were not going to be a rollover, right? I mean, you knew this was going to be a tough series because the Mets are fighting for their playoff lives. I mean, they're fighting for the, the last wild card spot. It really wasn't for the Mets, like this whole thing about, oh, we're going to catch the Phillies. I don't think that's how they viewed this at all. I think that the Mets were looking at it as, hey, we need to win this series because we need to beat out the Braves to get into the playoffs. Um, and so you knew it was going to be tough, and the Mets were going to give you all they could handle all that you can handle, and and they did. Um, credit to the Mets for playing a really good series. But, yeah, it's it, it's pretty incredible, Bob, when you look at, you know, names of guys that we never would have mentioned at the beginning of this season, middle of the season. I mean, you know, I even go back to the time when they were struggling in late July and early August. Were we, gonna, were we talking about Cal Stevenson winning them a game? Were we talking about Buddy Kennedy getting huge hits? Like, no, th these things the, the were The only time we were talking about Cal Stevenson was when Bryce Harper didn't pinch hit for him uh, in, right. that, in that Marlins series, right? I think right. It was, and you're like, come on, what are we doing? Like, this yeah. is a no-brainer. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, and so like it, it's things like that, that that made the weekend, I think, even more fun for fans because it's guys coming through the, the whole week, really. I mean, you go back to the Tampa series. It started there. We already talked about that a little bit. Um, but, uh, you, you know, to get to have it continue through the weekend. I mean, that that's a testament. Everybody wants to criticize and, and, and at times rightfully so uh, Dave Dombrowski for you know, the, the moves that he did not make, but sometimes you look at, you, you miss these minor transactions, right? And like in the middle of the season, when you make a trade with the Detroit Tigers for Buddy Kennedy and you put him in the minor leagues and nobody pays much attention to it other than the fact that he's a local guy, right? Um, that's the only reason you would pay attention to that trade, but then he comes up here and he's able to make a contribution. And even Cal Stevenson late, you know, at, at last off season, who, whatever, and then dude comes up here and gets some big hits and robs a home run that would have tied the game. Like those are moves that are just as important, if not, you know, maybe not as as big a flashy move as you wanted at the trade deadline. But those are wins that matter in this season, and so I think he deserves a little bit of credit for stuff like that. Yeah, there's there's no question about it. I mean, I think that we kind of focus on this fifth starter lack of depth lack of viable option and it's been a mess i mean colby allard was not very good uh you know this weekend either and but if you get you and i had a very brief exchange last night and i was watching the uh braves dodgers game and dodgers yeah. come back they explode late get a win rizal glacius has been so good for the braves was just a disaster in the ninth inning last night but i had said to you sometime around the fifth as i'm just watching this dodgers lineup and certainly they've had a, a rash of injuries as well on the pitching side of things, but just the lineup. I mean, it's Otani, it's Betts, it's Freeman, and then it is dreadful. Like they've gotten something out of Teoscar Hernandez, like good on him. Monty's been like fine. Gavin Lux was terrible at the start of the year. He's become functional here uh, in the second half, but it's just such a, like you watch that team and you're like, there's holes everywhere. And this is supposed to be the team standing in the way of the Phillies. And I just look at it like, yes, the Phillies have some, some areas where they're a little bit light, but you have to, you have to give credit for the buddy Kennedy's, the Cal Stevenson's hell, even Jose Ruiz, like is, who is a guy that mm -hmm. I had said, I go back two months ago, I was complaining about him. Like, dude, why do they keep going to this guy in, in somewhat key situations? And lo and behold, I mean, he's been, he's been phenomenal for them. I mean, is he, is he Kirkering? Is he Hoffman? Is he Strom? 
No, but like, I mean, he's been invaluable to them over the last two months here since the All Star break. You know, and you're right. And, um, you know, my thing that I always say to people um, when when they're watching other teams play for the, and not that you're watching them for the first time, but a lot of times it's 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 people who are not watching games outside of uh, the Phillies. I say oh, it's interesting what happens when you learn what's going on with other teams in the league and yeah. you're not just wa- not just basing all of your opinions on what you see every night with fi- with the Phillies because yes the Phillies do have their issues there's no question yeah and if do. they don't come back if they don't get a, a buddy Kennedy game tying hit yesterday and they don't win it in the ninth we could get on here and be like hey Phillies lost two out of three this weekend and yeah. and I think it's important to note this like I don't want to just let the end result totally skew the way that we're going about this because you could say well look Aaron Nola was a disaster in the fifth inning on Friday night that is as bad as it gets that's two straight starts now and I know he was better last September but again if you go back prior to 2023 we could talk about Aaron Nola in September and falling apart and what's this guy's deal and he was not big for them on Friday night we probably need to talk about that regardless but we could look at yesterday's game and say, come on, seriously, like David Peters is a nice pitcher, but you, are you seriously going to get shut out by him into the eighth inning? Where the hell was the top of the order yesterday? And Trey yeah. Turner had a hit. I think Harper walked, but like other than that, like Schwarber again, silent, it, it, we could, we could do that. Like we could talk about the Phillies problems because they exist. So I don't want to get on here and just say, hey, it's all good. You know, magic numbers five, they're going to clinch it by Thursday. They're going to stampede their way to the World Series. Like, there are real things here. But I would just invite everyone to to watch the rest of the sport, watch the rest of the National League, and you might feel a little bit better. And, and just to set that up, because you, I'm sure you have additional thoughts on that, but you look at week one of the NFL, right? Like, we know this every year this happens. But just look at what we found out yesterday. 49ers pummel the Jets on Monday Night Football. Hey, you don't need Christian McCaffrey. You got Kyle Shanahan, plug and play. Like Christian McCaffrey's an MVP player. At some point, his absence is going to catch up with you, at least to a degree. Not that the 49ers won't win 12 or 13 games, probably win the NFC West, but like Christian McCaffrey's absence matters. And just because you have one guy step up for one night in game one doesn't mean that it's a cure-all, that it's just automatically fixed. You look at the Dallas Cowboys. They obliterate the Browns. Oh, this defense is unbelievable. The Saints almost hung 50 on them yesterday. Mm-hmm. Like, So if you're an Eagles fan, independent of what happens tonight, barring catastrophic injury, and I feel like now that that's just come out of my mouth, something's going to happen. <laughs> but this is wood. I do have a, a wood desk here, so I'm going to just try to you know not knock on that and clear it. But like uh... the point being, you can pick apart your team until you're blue in the face. But all you have to do is step back and watch the rest of the league. And right now, if you're an Eagles fan, you're like, holy shit, all these teams have problems, right? Yeah. Phillies fans, and not just Phillies fans, but I think baseball fans, because you only have so much time. You, if you're going to watch a team for 140 to 162 games a year, like the, a lot of people do around here, you only have so much time you can allocate to a sport. So you're only really, really, truly most people watching the Phillies. And that's why you see all their deficiencies and kind of just look at the standings and say, ooh, the Dodgers, ooh, the Brewers. But ask a Brewers fan how they feel after yesterday's game. You know, they eliminate a 5 nothing deficit to Arizona, go up 8-5, to five, blow it, 8-8, eight, eight, go up 10-8 in extras, and then get walked off 11-8 in extras. Like, that's a miserable loss considering what's at stake for them right now. You think that they're all feeling great about the Brewers at the moment? Even after winning two or three, no. Exactly, you're exactly right. Yeah, I, I, you couldn't. I couldn't have said it better myself, Bob. And 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 that's not an arrogance thing, right? It's it's just not because I wholly admit that the Phillies have issues, and we talk about them on this show twice a week for an hour every week. And the reality of it is, though, that if we decided one week we're not going to talk about the Phillies, we're going to talk about the Padres, or we're going to talk about the Orioles, or we're going to talk about whoever, that we would find the same things to talk about that that you're talking about with the Phillies, and maybe even worse than what the Phillies' problems are. 
with a lot of these teams. Like the one, somebody mentioned something to me on Twitter the other night, other day. I forget exactly what the context of the conversation was, but talked about how uh, how awful it is that the Phillies can't figure out the number five starter. It was during Colby Allard's start, is when it was. Yeah. Um, and we were having this back and forth. And and I said to them, I said, look around baseball and tell me what team doesn't have a problem with the number five starter. Yeah. And in all honesty, and, and that's not to say that the Phillies shouldn't have some, had something better than they did. But the reality of it is, is that nobody has a good number five starter. Not a, there's not a team in baseball. The closest is is Seattle, right? I guess because of the way things kind of broke down with them. If you really want to say Brian Wu ended up being their their number five guy, I guess he's a five. I think he's far better than a five, but whatever. Um, but really, that's maybe the only team you can throw back at me and say, well, look, Seattle did it. And then I would sit counter and say, is Seattle even a playoff team? Like, that, like that's the re- that's the difference, right? Like, you maybe can come up with one. So to, to sit there and to harp on that being the biggest problem is a first-world problem. It really is a first-world problem because this guy's not going to be relevant in three weeks when the playoffs start. Right. So, like that to me, that's why that's why I think we we focus sometimes on the wrong thing. Do we need to talk about it because you know this is what we do? Yeah, of course we need to talk about it as the season progresses. It's a it's a talking point for sure, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not as important as everybody wants to make it out to be. I don't really want to focus a ton today on the offense. I, I thought that offensively this weekend it was it was pretty rough. I mean, they essentially did get shut out on. On Friday night, I know Marsh hits the homer late, and that's great. Whoop de doo. Yesterday was was rough. They obviously bear down in a key spot and get a win, and, and I applaud them for that. And it's nice to see JT Romuto deliver in that spot. That's great. Bryce Harper's power comes back on Saturday. We all know it had been like 34 calendar days since he had hit a home run. He does it, you know, and back to back at bats. It's great. We feel good about. I think a lot of different parts, but overall, they probably leave you wanting a little bit more. Where I do think it is fair to lean into some concern, it's not about the fifth starter spot. As you said, it will be irrelevant in three weeks. And I do think that they actually have some things to figure out on the bench, and I want to talk about that in a little bit. I want to get to the Austin Hayes question because I heard a comment this morning on WIP's morning show, uh, and I thought it was a very interesting talking point, so I'll bring that up. But where I do think that you can have some anxiety, if you you insist upon having anxiety this morning, is – around what we saw from Aaron Nola on Friday night. And and you were down there and you covered it and you stood there and you talked to him. And and I'm curious to get your insight onto that or into that. And then I think tonight's huge. Um, Not just because the Brewers, not because of what's at stake in the series, but it's time for Ranger Suarez to, to figure it out here. And I'll set this up by saying his first 15 starts, I saw him on June 19th against the Padres. Phillies actually lost the game, but he went six innings, only gave up one run. So through 15 games started, through 92 and a third innings, 175 ERA. Opponents at 191 against him with a 538 OPS. His nine starts since, and obviously only nine starts because he's missed significant time, 563 ERA. Opponents hitting 313 against him with an 834 OPS. Um, Two totally different pitchers this season. He's had some moments where he's looked like himself, he's had some moments where he looks borderline unusable. So now what? You know, and and what do you expect to see? What are they going to do if it doesn't look good? And, and I think that's the question here. Yeah, I, and, it's a, and you, you threw a lot at me there. So I'm going to say that I agree with you wholeheartedly that on both pitchers, both Suarez and Nola, they got to get their shit together over the final three to four starts of the three starts of the season uh, each. Um, and, and I think that they'll both get all three, uh, for, you know, the, 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 one thing that, you know, everybody thinks that the Phillies, once they lock it up, that they're just going to go on cruise control and they may rest some batters, you know, get some guys off their feet and, and, you know, give them some, some time off there. But the pitchers, I think are going to still pitch because they, they are shooting for the number one seed and they're trying to get the number one seed and the Dodgers, they finished the season with three of their final four series against the Marlins and Rockies. So, you know, the Phillies are going to have to really uh, that last series against the Nationals is, is honestly going to matter um, in, the, in in that hunt. But it matters more, I think, for these two guys, 
Suarez is more of a con- is more of a concern than Nola um, because it's more I think physical and 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 that that's a that's an issue because he he was great until all of a sudden his back started bothering him and then he's not been good since his back started bothering him so and now he's got a bit of a dead arm issue according to Rob Thompson which is like well yeah that's why his velocity is down if you can't get that velocity back to where it needs to be it doesn't differentiate his pitches enough. Yeah. And that's that's the reason why he's become more hittable. So like that is a, a concern to me. And I sit there and say, if he can't get it back, what role is he on this in, in this roster at that point? Um, he's probably still your number four guy. Um, but really, that might be all that he is. And, and kind of in the same way that Christopher Sanchez was the number four guy against the Diamondbacks last year and through two innings, right? Like, I mean, like that's the kind of like that might be, unfortunately, what Ranger is in October, just because Uh, I mean, I I, I feel like we've actually reached a point here. I I mean, I will say this in a five game series. I don't think Ranger Suarez starts a game for them. Well, they, he might have to because of the they don't have the extra day off this year. If you don't have the extra day built in, yeah. Like 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 last year, it, it alternated. This is this is all because of TV. Yeah, you're and right. They, and they all and they alternate it every year. Just to explain to people. So yeah. last year there were two days. There was an extra day off in the division series, which was why the Phillies were able to get away with just going with three starters yeah. against the Braves. Um, the American League didn't have it, but the year before the American League had it. So now we're in year three, an odd number of years. The American League gets the extra day in the division series, so the Phillies wouldn't have that. So they will, if this, if the division series goes to a fourth game, they will need a fourth different starter because of the way that it maps out. Um, unless you're throwing somebody on three days rest, which I don't think you're going to do, uh, or you go to a bullpen game, you could always do that. Um, and, and Ranger can be part of that, but I do think that that's the role that he. Unless he shows you in his next three starts, that's the role that he's going to be put into probably in the playoffs. I know that you and uh, John Foley uh, over at on Patterson talked about, um, you know, <laughs> who starts a game to Suarez yes. or, or I'm sorry, uh, Sanchez or, or Nola. And um, I, I briefly read it. Is, the, is there a world, though, where, you know, if, if everything continues as is that you would get off your stance that Nola is your game two guy and, you know, uh, yes, and, and just to, just to kind of point out up front, I mean, obviously that was a story that ran on the same day as the debate, right? So we yeah, yes. we needed to, we needed to have a de- a quote unquote debate story, um, and so each of us had to take a side. So it, whether you wanted to or not, it was going to be one of us was taking Sanchez and one of us was taking Nola. I offered to take Nola. I'm you know, I am not surprised that you took. Nola. Yeah, well, because I mean, I, I I tend to be the Nola apologist, right? I get it and I know it. Um. But no, I, I'm not. I'm not opposed to the idea. I just don't think it's it's because, and I don't want anybody to think it's because. Well, Christopher Sanchez only pitches well at home, so we got to make sure he starts at home. I, I don't think that's the case because does anyone really believe, after the way he p- pitched yesterday, that he's going to face this same same team five days from now on Friday night or Saturday night in uh, uh, in New York? And he's going to get lit up just because it's not Citizens Bank Park. Like, I, did like, you just I, jinx him? Did, no, did I, mean, I just jinx I mean, the Eagles? Did you just jinx Christopher Sanchez? <laughs> but that's my point. Like, I, like I, I don't think that the home road thing is is anything that's a real, real thing. Like, I like if the Phillies are going to make Christopher Sanchez start Game Two, it's because they feel like they have a better chance in that order of Wheeler, Sanchez, Nola, one, two, three, then they do the other way around, not because it's because the game's in Philadelphia, right? Like, let's be, I just want to get that out of the way. That's not a reason to do it. It, The reason to do it, the reason to go Sanchez two and Nola three is because Sanchez has just been that good, Yeah. right? I mean, you know, that's the reason to do it. And have nothing to do. You could sit there and, and throw it out there. That, oh, yeah. Plus, he's got a 2.05 ERA at home. O- okay. But it, really, in the grand scheme, it's a small sample. Let me let me bring you back to last season. Because this, this ties into the Ranger Suarez conversation. And now, unfortunately, we're kind of doing this with Aaron Nola again. Where it's, it's the beginning of September, midway point of September. And we're like, oh, boy. Uh, what exactly does this look like behind Zach Wheeler at the moment? 
Last year, uh, Aaron Nola faced the Brewers in Milwaukee on September 2nd. The Phillies lost 7-5. Nola went four and two-thirds, gave up eight hits, seven earned runs. He walked three, only struck out five. It was one of those Aaron Nola starts where you're like, oh, my God. Like, everything was a struggle. Uh, hung a lot of pitches. His ERA after that game had reached 4-5-5. His next start, they come home, they play the Marlins. You figure here's an opportunity for him to get going. It's September 9th. Phillies win the game 8-4, but Aaron Nola only goes four and a third, gives up seven hits, gives up four earned runs, and that brings his season ERA to 4-6-4. So then you get to the 15th, and you're like, all right, like right, we're running out of time. We need Aaron Nola to really give us one of those vintage Aaron Nola starts. And again, he can't get through five innings against the Cardinals in a 5-4 win. Four and two-thirds, seven hits, uh, two earned, uh, only strikes out one. Like, And you're like, dude, what the hell are we watching here? And like, we have big-time concern. And then it was that next start, finally, on September 20th. And I'm, I'll explain why I'm pointing this out game by game in a moment. But six innings against the Braves only allows two earned runs. The next start against the Pirates, six and two-thirds, one earned run. Looked like himself, no walks, eight strikeouts. And those final two regular season starts created some momentum going in where he was really good against the Marlins in the first playoff start. He was good against the Braves in his second start. He was great against the Diamondbacks in that game two start where they won 10 nothing. And then obviously we know uh, game uh, six it was, wasn't wasn't himself. But the point being is that you can not feel great about a guy right now on September 16th. You can not feel great about Aaron Nola right now on September 16th because we did this last year with him, and then he was able to dial it in and give them five really good starts. Um, and you hope that that applies here, uh, although he's been much better overall this season than he was a year ago. I, I, in my opinion, anyway. I don't yeah. Think it's close. Yeah. And, and, and I mean, certainly for Ranger Suarez, same principle applies here. Yeah, for sure. There's still time. I mean, people don't think there is, but because the playoffs start in, in exactly 19 days for the Phillies, um, with all assumptions in place that they're going to, that they clinch this division and, and get a bye. Um, but yeah, you're right. I mean, there is still time. And if you go back even further, Bob, Nola kind of did a similar thing in 22 as well. It was a little bit, it wasn't as pronounced as it was last year. Um, But if you go back to 22 and go through his game by game, you'll see September started bad and then progressively got better. And then he was good in the playoffs until the Padres game. Uh, And then, and then they started to fall off at that point. Um, But yeah, I mean, look, I do think that there's something to be said. And and part of the argument that I was making um, in, in the article with John Foley is there's something about the Phillies that that I buy into, and I don't I don't think a lot of people do, but I think that there is something to this, and I think as a former baseball coach manager, you would you would say the same thing that there is there is a an immeasurable element to the trust factor, right? Like that that you really can't put into some kind of statistical measurement. And the belief and trust in your guys to perform is something that can carry you through and can carry a player through to be better even after they struggle. And I think that the Phillies, it started with last November signing him to that $172 million contract. That's them saying to Aaron Nola, we believe in you. All right, you just had a down year overall, but you are so in- uh, integral and important to our team and our pursuit of a championship that we're still going to give you $172 million over seven years. It begins with the contract, right? Then he has a nice year. He's hit a spot here where he's not pitching well. And, and, and if he can get it back together, and this is why Rob Thompson won't answer the question yet, because there, he under, he understands that there's still three starts to go for all these pitchers and that there's an opportunity still for Aaron Nola to continue to be the guy who fits into that number two spot. It doesn't mean it's locked up. It could well be Christopher Sanchez, but the, but the, the trust factor and the belief factor, and you ride that out until you can't ride that out any longer. And I think that that's part of the reason why, why it's still a possibility that it stays as we expect it with Aaron Nola at number two. 
and and that and that makes sense. And I think it's well said. What did you see from him specifically uh, on Friday night, though? I mean, when you you step back and look at the situation, yeah, and you look at uh, the end result, uh, certainly the fifth inning, two three run homers. I know that he focused on the beginning after the game. I did listen to him talk. I thought that the start of the game was almost problematic, though. I know he settled in in the third and fourth and was really crisp, but I felt like, in a way, that maybe that first inning gutted him a little bit more than than you know you would have thought initially, given the way that he had picked it up there for a couple I, innings. I, I agree. Like so, the first two hitters, he's great, and then he ends up getting in two very long at bats with Brandon Nimmo and Pete Alonso. Both end up being walks, but they were lengthy at bats, and it, that inning. I think it did take a toll on him. And Thompson said it too after the game that he felt that that, that happened. And I asked him that question after the game. And he said it, it Nola wouldn't say yes, but he said it's possible, right? Because, but, but then, you know, the reality of it is, is that he does retire 10 consecutive batters going into the fifth inning. And you're sitting there through four innings. He's got given up no hits, two walks. He's retired 10 straight guys, and you're thinking, this is going to be that NOLA game that you were thinking of, like the Braves last year in September, right? Yeah. This is going to be, he's going to have that game it when, you know, against a good team like the Mets. And so everybody's kind of confident at that point. And he gives up, you know, the first hit he gives up. I think it was uh, Iglesias that gets the first hit off him in the fifth. And it's kind of just a blue pit to right field. Okay, fine. All right. Then the next guy comes up and gets a hit, and it's, uh, I think it's Vientos. Pulls it through the hole. His Turner almost gets to it, but doesn't quite. Base it. Okay, fine. Then he hangs the curveball to you know on the next pitch, and then it's boom. You know, three. You're down three to nothing, and it's like this is the thing that he's got to avoid. And I don't know what it is, but it's it's a matter of this. He tries throwing that curveball a little too fine. He releases it a little bit early. He talked about it. And, and he's frustrated. He's absolutely frustrated about it. Um, you know, and you can see it on his face. You can hear it in his voice. You know, but I, I do I do think he's a guy who knows how to kind of get past a game like that. And that's the one thing about him that it's why I've always been a defender of him because he's not a guy who lets it snowball, 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 even though he's had stretches of games that haven't been great. One of the things that, that I have repeatedly said on the show is it's about October. It's about the playoffs. It's, you know, just let's get there almost. I, I've seen what I need to see. Can we just start the damn thing? And it, it it sort of feels that way to me right now. And so I don't think it's appropriate to have this greater Aaron Nola conversation. But if the Phillies do go on to win a World Series this season, then you're going to say that the Aaron Nola deal was a win, no matter mm -hmm. what happens in years two, three, four, five, six, like it won't matter because you brought him back for this year. He presumably delivers, they get a championship. But I do think if they don't win the World Series this year, which is very possible, there's going to be a time where you and I talk, whether it be in the middle of November, maybe the middle of January, maybe it's the run up to the season next year where we work through the question of, was this a good deal? Did the Phillies do the right thing in signing Aaron Nola? And you want to talk about a debate, you could have that debate because there's this feeling of this guy is not a true top of the rotation dude. Like, And there's always this feeling about, hey, this is a big game. They really need him to deliver. And like, it's almost like, and he has, like I just pointed out, those first three starts he made in the postseason last year were very good. In 22, he had some good postseason starts. It's it's not that he hasn't ever done it, but doesn't it, I, I don't want to say doesn't it and set you up and make you say yeah, but there is this feeling I think that exists amongst a lot of fans that's like, come on, like... Well, here's how I looked at it, Bob, and, and and maybe this will maybe this will will help the conversation. When I looked at that contract, and the reason I thought it was a good contract was because I felt that it was paying a guy commensurate to what you expect out of him for each of those seven years. And what I mean by that is, you expect him to be your number two for at least three 
of the seven years. Year four can probably be like, okay, maybe he's still your two, but if he becomes your three, it doesn't kill you. And then by years five, six, and seven, if he's your number three guy, by that point, paying that guy that kind of money is going to be a good deal. Yeah. For that, for that yeah. value. So like yeah, I think so that fair. was how, and I think that that's kind of how I looked at it and thought, okay, well, that's if you map it out that way, that this actually turns out to be a good contract. But if he's not your number two next year and the year after, and he's become your three, and then he falls down to a four at the end, well, then it doesn't become a good contract, right? Then it's then it's less of a good contract, right? So I think that that's where the conversation really has to be. You know, as long as he could continue to be 180 innings, your number two guy, ERA in the mid threes, that's a good contract. It's yeah. a really good contract. But if he starts falling off and becomes a guy who can't go six or seven innings, he's only throwing five, and he's, his URA is hovering over four, and he's more of a middle-of-the-rotation guy, well, then, yeah, then it's a bad deal. Let's just look at it and the innings, the dependability. He does have these flash starts. He does get deep into games a lot of times. Like, I think that, the, that it all lines up. Like, if you just – if you were not watching the Phillies every night and from afar, you say Aaron Noll is really good. He's, he's a really quality pitcher. Is he one of the five best pitchers in the sport? No. Is he Zach Wheeler? No, he's not. But is he a dependable number two type that, that you know is there that provides significant value over the course of 162 games, over the course of 32, 33 starts in a season? Yeah. yeah. But I do think situationally, I, I certainly have always understood this. I, I, I and I get anybody that comes away from that game Friday night kind of rolling their eyes, groaning and saying like, "Oh my god, with this guy." And like, I mean, well, though, he, he, though it misses the made, big picture. Yeah. Oh, and, I, and, I, and that was the lead to my story on on Patterson on 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 Friday after the game was that you know there is a faction of fans out there who get annoyed with Aaron Nola all the time, and he did nothing to quiet that in that game because it was yeah. exactly what people complain about that the guy pitches well and then all of a sudden it can turn on you right and it happened in that game and you can't defend it you can't sit there and say oh well but there was just that one bad inning otherwise it was great no you can't in that case it, you can't defend it there's just no defending because it was such a bad inning and you can't let that snowball like that and put and take your team out of the game it's one thing to have a, a bad inning where you give up a couple runs. You say, okay, well, all right, now if you come back out the next inning and stem the tide and hold it down, all right, you only give up three runs. It wasn't a great inning, but the team's still in the game. You give up six, you give up two three-run homers yeah. in an inning, something he hadn't done not just in a game before, but all season he had only allowed two three-run homers. He allowed two in one inning against the Mets. Like, you can't let it get that bad. And, and that's where that's where. He well, I also wonder how much of that's on on Rob, though. It, it, like, there's a point where you say, "Hey, this is one of my dudes. I'm going to let him work through this." But as we're working up to the second three run homer, I'm thinking maybe maybe we just don't have it here. Maybe we maybe we kill this at, at three zero with a couple guys on base. Yeah, it's fair. I, I, the only thing was is that I can tell you this is being down there. They didn't have anybody up. Yeah. After the first home run. And so, I mean, if you want to put the blame on him, it's because it's there. You say, okay, yeah. maybe we should get somebody up, and they didn't. So, but it was, it just took, you know, another couple hits. And then all of a sudden it was like, oh crap, we got to get somebody up, right? To get out, to get this, to get this done, you know. And then Ruiz is a quick, he can get him, he can get ready quick. Um, and then it, he was ready to go after the second home run. But yes, you're right. It was a couple batters too late at that point. They probably should have had somebody up and, and going right at, as soon as the first home run was hit. Well, what's what's interesting now is you'll see him again on Wednesday, uh, Aaron Nola, and he's going to have to be good because well, – Yeah, and the, I, toughest I in the toughest matchup of all the pitchers, I mean, he's facing he's, Freddie like Peralta. He's going to have to be good because not only are you you're facing a, a nice Milwaukee team here, but you're also going to see Freddie Peralta, who's yeah. pretty solid himself. So, I mean, Aaron Nola needs a rebound start not only for the Phillies on Wednesday night to win a game that could be very important, but also – to kind of do what we just talked about, which is sort of reset here as you close to the back half of September and try to gather yourself where you're not just taking the ball in October on the heels of four or five bad starts in a row and you just pray and hope and cross your fingers that it's going to work out and that he's going to be able to flip the switch. Uh, one other thing I do want to touch on, um, and then we can take it wherever you want, 
Uh, Jose Ruiz, like, are we reaching a point? And he threw a key inning yesterday. I believe it was the top of the ninth, gets him into the bottom of the ninth, gives him an opportunity to walk it off. Are we reaching a point where not that he is going to jump over any of the other uh, late inning guys in this bullpen, but does it maybe, if we're thinking out here a little bit, does, does it change the way that maybe the Phillies or Rob Thompson will sort of deploy the bullpen in the postseason? Does this mean that they're on a little bit of an even shorter leash? Uh, you know, the, the Ranger Suarez is the world, or if you don't fully trust Christopher Sanchez, or if Aaron Nola looks like he's headed towards a blow-up, do they feel more comfortable maybe yanking a guy in the fourth or fifth inning now because you have yet another arm that can maybe bridge you to the, the, the you know the elite guys in the back of this bullpen? I, I do. I think that Ruiz has become a guy that they trust in those situations and in, in games that are either you're down, uh, you know, a run or two and you want to keep it close um, or the game is tied, but it's early, even though it was late yesterday. Um, I think that was because they were just trying to manage certain guys in the bullpen, which was why he was the option yesterday. Um, but I do think that he's the sixth guy in that pen now. I, I think that your top five are set. We know who the top five are. And the, the Phillies were always searching for a sixth, seventh guy. I think Ruiz is pretty much locked in now as number six. In it's that it's funny, right? Like you go back to March and we talked about, is this is this one of the better bullpens in the sport? And everyone laughed it off after opening day. Like, yeah, you got to be kidding me. Um, they've had their moments where they've struggled. Uh, but you are now at the midway point of September and things can happen. And maybe they blow up. I don't know but you're at the middle point of September and you can't ask for much more than the way that Matt Strom, Jeff Hoffman, Estevez, Alvarado has come back. Kirkering has been, you know, phenomenal here. Phenomenal. And then, yeah. and then you look at Jose Ruiz since the all-star break. And just to set this up, because he pitched two games against the A's in that final series leading into the all-star break. They lost both of them. Um, and he was bad in both. In those two games, he gave up five earned runs and got hit around too. I mean, he was, he was not good in those two appearances. And you're kind of like, what are we doing with this guy? He comes back. Since the All Star break, he has made 19 appearances. He's thrown six and 16 and two thirds. He's only given up eight hits, two earned runs, 23 strikeouts to six walks. He has a 1.08 ERA. Opponents hitting 138 against him. They're slugging 224 against him. It's a 440 OPS, man. He has been yeah. like that. Is, if, if And we're talking about him as your sixth guy. I'm not saying yeah. that I trust him in October to be taking down seventh and eighth inning outs and in tie games or protecting one-run leads. But if you said to anybody right now that this guy is your closer and this is yeah. the second half that he'd have, you would say, sign me up. And right. so to have that as your sixth guy, I mean, point being here, you could not ask for a much better bullpen setup going in. I don't know what's going to happen. These guys got to do it. They got to execute. But on paper, on September 16th, holy shit. Yeah, no, I, I agree, Bob. And, you know, it's interesting to me. It's, you know, we were you were talking about the, the bench guys earlier, and I'm sure we're going to talk about playoff roster construction here before we wrap up the show because it's, I think that's an interesting conversation. But when you consider those six guys, and Ruiz has been – Excellent. He really has been the second half of the year. And they keep talking about it too. Like they bring it up. We don't even ask. And, you know, Rob brings it up. Caleb Cotham brings it up. I was talking to Cotham about, um, I did a story on Alvarado uh, last week, and, and he brought up Ruiz in that conversation. And so I was like, oh, we, we kind of forget about him out there. Um, but because of, of how good he's been and becoming that sixth guy, I think there's a thought that in the division series, they may not have as many guys available in the bullpen as you would normally have in the playoffs. They may carry an extra bench bat um, because they feel like they have two positions where they got to kind of match up, right? So they may carry one fewer relief pitcher because they trust six guys so much and carry an extra bench bat instead. And that's all because of how well Ruiz has pitched. In all honesty, he's been a, a difference maker in the sense of we're thinking differently in the playoffs. Um, I, your, Tanner Banks is probably your seventh guy, okay, just because he's the other lefty. Um, and then you're going to have one long guy, whoever Would that is. Would you trust is. him in a, a uh, one nothing game? You're holding a one nothing lead uh, in the – or actually, no, it, it wouldn't be one nothing. Let's say you're holding a 5-4 lead in the fifth inning. 
It's yeah. a lot of offense going on. You got a second and third, two outs. You got a left-handed hitter. Do you go to one of your big boys, or do you trust Banks enough to, to get you through the fifth? You're, it depends on how much you've used the other guys, but that sounds like a spot for Alvarado to me. Mm -hmm. okay. He's your most automatic against yeah. lefties. Like, I mean, that, like, I, I still think that Alvarado probably gets that spot if you're protecting a lead. Um, but it, it, let's say you're down in a game yeah. and you don't or, want it to get out of hand, then maybe you can go, maybe you go banks in that spot. Right. Or you're yeah. holding a 10 5 lead in the sixth or, yeah. or something like, yeah, 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 yeah. But then there's going to be one more long, there's going to be one long guy who that, whether that's Taiwan Walker, whether Spencer Turnbull gets back and he's able to get into that spot. Taiwan uh, Walker they, helping the Phillies win a game on Saturday. It felt the, it told me afterwards, is the best he's felt all year. <laughs> Said he made a mechanical good, good adjustment. For good, good for that guy. You know, he said I don't, he made I don't a know. mechanical adjustment. <laughs> made a mechanical adjustment, and everything is great. All of a sudden, uh, look, he does that one more time. I mean, I could make a case for him being the fourth starter in a playoff series. <laughs> you know what, though, Bob? The thing that the thing of it is, and and look, good on him, right? Yeah. I mean, it's good it's been him. tough for him to deal with what he's had to deal with, and he's out there still working. I give the guy a lot of credit for for toughing through what is a Bad, been a bad year for him but the reality of it is he faced 11 batters in that game and still didn't strike anybody out right he's not getting any swing and miss so yes he had some weak contact and that's good but you can't you can't not be a, not strike anybody out again and can and think it's a really good out yeah it no was, it, was, it was not great but hey we'll it take it. you know you take, you, it take little, it. you take whatever you can get there but yeah look right. i mean talking about this this construction and you know if they do carry an extra bench bat i'll go back to what i asked you on friday because we've had three more games now we had a cal stevenson game we had a buddy kennedy game and last week we had a weston wilson game is austin hayes on this postseason roster and this is i said this earlier i alluded to this earlier i was listening to uh wip morning show and joe de camera and james seltzer were talking about austin hayes and they said no he's he's not gonna be on it and I'm like, could they really take a guy that they felt that good about against left-handed pitching and to the point where they were willing to kind of, even though we know he doesn't really, really hit right-handers, like, but he's our everyday guy. Like, if we really in a month gone from he's our everyday left fielder to like maybe not rostering this guy? So here's the thing with him. Um, this is a more serious kidney infection situation than I think that they're letting on. Um, he didn't travel with them to Milwaukee Interesting. and they, the reason he didn't travel is because the doctors didn't think it was safe wow. for him to go up in the, on a plane with <laughs> the med medication that he's on. So that's something, man. Like when you can't, when you're told not to get on a plane, like because of the meds you're on, like that's, that's scary. So and he has, he's been there, he's been working out, he's readily available, he's willing to talk about it. Um, Tim Kelly did a nice interview with him and got a great story out of him. He's just not, he's lost some weight, he doesn't feel right in the lower half, like his his legs just, they don't have strength or speed to them, right? So for, just, for that reason, do you kind of just say, like, it's unlikely that in 17 days he's going to yeah. have faculties about they don't know they around. they don't know they don't think they don't know and so i think it's a real possibility that he's not there not because of lack of production but because of what he's going through do i think that he's a guy that you're just going to dismiss and forget about no because i think what ultimately could happen bob is maybe he's not on the first division series roster but that he's okay to go by the lcs if they get there and then then you have a decision to make. Do you bring right. him back into the into the fold? But I yeah, do think there's a possibility that he's not there for the division series. Yeah, and it makes sense. I mean, look, he hasn't played since September 1st, which was the walk-off win uh, against the, the Braves on Sunday Night Baseball. And then he went on the uh, IL on September 5th. So sometime between the 2nd, 3rd, and 4th, he developed this infection. Uh, and you're talking about now at least 12 days ago. Um, and he's at a point where he can't get on a plane because the medication he's taking after two weeks creates a dangerous situation for him. So, I mean, that is, you know, he said it like, is it more serious than they're letting on? I don't know. Is this just procedural and this is what they expected? Yeah. I mean, that's entirely possible, but this isn't like a, 
you know, hey, I had a, a UTI and I had to take an antibiotic and I'm all good to go here. Like this is this is some it sounds pretty rough. Yeah, it does sound rough. And and so so you know, not to diminish that, and we all hope that Austin Hayes gets better and 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 that he's okay to go and play baseball soon. Um, but it does bring bring up the question of what does your bench look like? Yeah, for the playoffs, and and I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's pretty similar to what it looks like right now. Um, uh, the only change is, you know, obviously Sosa will be back on Tuesday tomorrow. Um, and that eliminates uh, Kennedy, probably. I mean, because that's the Roy Kennedy's kind of filling his role, right? Um, and Kennedy cannot play the outfield, so. I think Kennedy's probably the guy that goes down in that spot. So you got Sosa, Stubbs you have to carry as your backup catcher. Um, and then it gets interesting because then you now – normally you have two spots, two other spots, but now you may have three because you're only going to carry eight in the bullpen instead of nine. They, they still could go nine in the bullpen. But I think because of Ruiz that they're only going to go eight in the bullpen and – and they're going to go with an extra bench bat because they have to mix and match. Rob Thompson's already pinch hit more this year than he has in either of the last two seasons, right? So that tells you that they're not comfortable with either, with anybody in the out and left. Field All right, so field if, if that's the case, if there's three spots and Hayes is not back. You're probably looking Clemens, Wilson, Wilson. Ro well, Rojas. Okay. Probably, right? And then, well, I, I don't know. Let's think of it this way. Are we considering Rojas one of the nine? I, I guess I'm considering Rojas the starter right so now. Let's, so let's say, let's say. I don't know. I mean, what are they going to do? That's actually, that is probably the more interesting question, if we're yeah. being honest here. Because, like, yes, like, they have these deficiencies. And because they have these deficiencies, it's they're probably going to need to tap into this bench you know, whatever you want to call it, this triumvirate, like, it, like they're going to yeah. need to, they're going to need to do this because these guys are matchup problems. Right. That being said, like, do you, do you just go Rojas in center or do you do the Martian center and better bat? And well, left so, thing? so here's the thing. So let's, let's, so let's assume just for the sake of this conversation that Rojas and Marsh are part of your nine. Right. So yeah. now you need five bench guys. Yeah. So it, it probably is. Stubbs, Sosa, Clemens, Wilson, and Stevenson for the division series. Now Stevenson on the playoff roster. I love it. I love it. Oh, well, I'm I'm just saying because that if that's the case, I want to see Cal Stevenson play a little bit here. Uh I do. Like I want to make yeah. sure like well, I mean, it. so yeah, but here's the thing. It's not that you're thinking about using Cal Stevenson as a pinch hitter, but what you could do is you could use Cody Clemens to pinch hit for Rojas. Yeah, and then put Stevenson in the outfield because yeah. he's still a good defensive outfielder, right? So I think that he kind of serves that role as the last guy on the bench who's a defensive replacement, pinch runner. And hey, if you emergency need another left-handed pinch hitter, he's that guy. But he's second behind Cody as yeah. far as pinch hitting off the bench. So I, I think that that's really the direction they might go in the division series. I'll give Johan Rojas some credit. Nice bunt yesterday, late. He got one down. He got one down. Almost beat was, it out. Took a nice stunned. play by the Mets. They executed the play well. Um, Iglesias was pretty pissed. <laughs> he was not thrilled. No, he was not thrilled. Um, first inning though, like, come on, man, like, catch the ball, yeah. like, uh. like that. That play drove me nuts because again, it's it, it's. I think it's a situation, Bob. I don't, he he like, I don't know that he needed yes. to die. Like I don't know that he needed to die. Like what? Yes. You, we talked about make... this last week when we were defending him for dropping the the home run, and people were yeah. killing him. I'm like, you can't kill him for that play. It's a tough play. But we did say he puts a little extra sauce on his his play sometimes, where he doesn't need to, and that was a perfect example of it. And my yeah. only thing is, it's like, you know, does it really matter? I guess not. But if you're gonna I feel like it's like propaganda. Like we're getting sold on this idea that this guy is prime Griffey Jr. in center field. And he's like, he's just not. He's not. Right. right. And that's the thing. Like on that play, and that's what drove me crazy on the play was like, if you just don't have to show off the flair of diving to catch the ball, you catch the ball. Yeah. Right. Like just make it, make the catch. 
That's it. I just think Don't it's my fear it. with him. My my fear with him, and maybe he does it because he had a big play in the postseason last year and against the Braves, where he made a great catch yeah. and like saves maybe the game for them and maybe they don't even win that seat like that happened and i have to acknowledge that but and it, like, i'll i'll just say this that could happen again he could go out and and save three runs with a great catch in the alley that nobody else on that roster can can you know get to it and i like i acknowledge that and i guess that's why you you roster him that's why you do this and you hope it works out my feeling right now, though, is that it is more likely than not that he is going to cost you, that he is going to do something in a spot of importance where he either doesn't, you know, rein it in, he doesn't make the play, he has a bad at bat. Like, I just feel like that's the more likely outcome. I don't know. I just can't I get over it. I know it's time for me to get over it because every week I get on here, at least once a week, one of our two shows a week, I have something on him where I'm like, come on, man. Yeah. But like, no, I just, agree. I agree with you, though. I agree with you. I agree All with right. you. And I think the Phillies agree, which is why they're thinking about carrying an extra person on the bench, because yeah. they just don't trust him enough to be a guy that you could play. It's like, it's like, how do you tap into his athleticism and his de defensive upside? That's what I'll call it. His defensive upside. But how do you do that while also protecting yourself in four other ways? In doing so, and that, yeah. that's really what their whole bench—that's all the, the whole construction of the bench—is about, essentially, at this point. Yeah, so. exactly. exactly. All right, right. Um, and, and 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 as far as base running, like he had another play where he overslid the bag. I know, you know, like he had it stolen, but he overslid the bag, and like, yeah. like those little things. Imagine those things happening in a playoff game. That's what I'm saying. Like, it's bad enough that it happens in a game, and it, all yeah. right, it's not a big deal. They win the games that both of these instances happen in. No, no, you know, no harm, no foul. But you do that in a playoff game, it's magnified by 150,000, right? Like, you, you can't have those things happen in those moments. And he has shown all season that he cannot get past having those moments. And that's right. what that's the concern for me. Yep. All right. Well, one last thing. So um, one last thing, and, and I should point out uh, just for the, the sake of uh, the listening audience, uh, because my wedding is Saturday, yes. uh, this will be my last appearance for the next uh, week or so. Uh, I'll be back uh, the final Friday of the regular season. So uh, you'll be discussing the the uh, champagne celebration. Oh, no, no. That's, that's the third jinx scenario that, that we set up <laughs> in this show. You'll be talking about that uh, with my son, Anthony Jr., who will be filling in for me uh, for those two episodes with you, Bob. Um, but we were in the car yesterday, and usually we have when we have our, our rides, our Sunday, uh, we, we spend a lot of time together on Sundays, and uh, usually when we have uh, our drive together, there's a lot of baseball debate going on. But yesterday we had – a conversation where we were in ultimate agreement and i wanted to throw it to you to see if if you feel the same way we were talking about the american league mvp race and it seems to me that it's a foregone conclusion that aaron judge is going to win the mvp right i mean it's hard not to say you know the season that he put together and he's 53 home runs his ops is off the off the charts where would the yankees be if he weren't there right i get it and all that but Anthony and I both agreed that what Bobby Witt is doing for the Kansas City Royals is far more impressive. And the fact of the matter is, is that this shouldn't be a slam dunk for Judge. In fact, it should probably go the other way. And it harkens back. Tell me if it if this reminds you of uh, if it reminds you of this too. It harkens back to the whole Miguel Cabrera Mike Trout race in 2012. Uh, you know, and I know that Cabrera got it. He won the Triple Crown, and that's something that doesn't happen, right? I mean, I get it and everything, but Trout was so, so sensational that year that it just kind of got lost in the shuffle. I think Bobby Witt's the AL MVP, and, and if I had a vote, that's who, that's where I would go. How, what do you think about it? Aaron, Aaron Judge has 53 homers. He's knocked in 132 runs. Is a one one four seven OPS, and we're talking about this guy not being the AL MVP. Do you think he's being powered by being a Yankee? Is that what this yes. is about? In your opinion? Oh, I, I mean, mean, I do. I do think that that helps. He, yeah. he is minus three thousand right now to win the AL MVP award. He's going to win it. Like Bobby, yeah, Witt I know. Could, 
You're to not be retired the remainder of the season, and it won't matter. Like, yeah. I mean, Judge is going to – there's no doubt Judge is going to win it. But if you look at Bobby Witt's numbers and, and, and the position that he plays, and he's going to win a gold glove there too. Yeah. Or, He's at least going to be a finalist, but I think I think he's going to win the gold glove there. Um, but when you look at what he the numbers he's putting up, and it's just it's off the charts for. Well, I remember we talked about last week. Like, where's where's the three hundred hitter in in yeah. twenty twenty four? I mean, he's hitting three thirty three right now. You know, yeah. I mean, it's, it's he's had a great year. Uh, OPS plus got, like one seventy one. I mean, that's astronomical. Yeah. And he's hitting, he's got what thirty five home runs? Am I right yeah. about that? Or it's, uh, like that? so looking at this real quick, he's got thirty one homers, thirty one, uh, forty three doubles, and eleven triples. I mean, that's that's phenomenal. Stolen bases? Uh, let's see here. Stolen bases. I don't have it on this line. How does that even? Ha- oh, here we go. Uh, twenty eight. Okay. Yeah. So he's so he's going to have twelve times. Though twenty eight of forty isn't great, but. Yeah, he's going to have 30 stolen bases. 30 stolen bases. So he's going to be a 30-30 guy, right? Hitting 333, playing the toughest position in the, in in baseball and carrying a team that had no business yeah. being in this conversation to a playoff spot. Like I, yep. I don't know. I I just look at that and I say that guy to me, and if you go by FanGraphs war, or they're only off by 0.1 between the two of them. Do you think Judge's recent now he hits the grand slam the other night against yeah, the I Red know. Sox? That, he gets that the probably moment. seals it. We know how we talk about this all the time. Like MVPs, they have moments, and and that yeah. was one of them. And that was off of a, a streak in which he hadn't homered for 16 games. In a way, like if if this weren't Aaron Judge and this weren't a Yankee, he probably would have let the MVP race come back to Bobby Witt because. He hadn't homered in over two weeks, and it was yeah. September. And you're like, all right, like he's not having a great September. Here comes Bobby Wood, who's been out of his mind. Like I could go for all that. It makes sense. I, I would, if I had a vote, I would still vote Judge. I certainly understand it. I get it. And and any other year, that probably is your MVP. What I think is interesting is, and look, I am I'm more than willing to concede that Francisco Lindor has had a great season. I, for the life of me, and I saw it a lot this weekend with the Phillies playing the Mets on online, on Twitter. I, I don't understand the Francisco Lindor should be the NL MVP argument at all. I mean, he has been so good for them. He had a huge moment against the Blue Jays. They're getting no hit. He hits the home run. Like, I, I get it. Like, I get that he has had a great year. He's not the MVP of the National League this season. Well, you can have that debate with Anthony on Friday because uh, he he thinks he is. <laughs> uh, come on, but I, I but I agree on, with you. <laughs> I agree. I'm gonna because he's he's gonna come in and he's gonna do all of his homework. So now that's gonna uh, now I gotta make sure I'm sharp for Friday because he's gonna yeah, hear no, this and he's gonna say I'm gonna blow this guy away. <laughs> I, I, you but, know. He, but he his art and I'll give you I'll give you a little tease, dude. How about this? Let me hot take you real quick. Go Forget ahead. Otani. Like Otani should be the MVP in my opinion. Yeah, I think Cattell Marte has had a better year than Francisco Lindor. I agree with that, and and Anthony and Anthony will he'll side with you on that too. But his argument for Lindor is that Cattell Marte, you know, was injured and missed some time, yeah. so it probably hurt him a little bit. Otherwise, he would make the argument for Cattell Marte. But he, he Anthony is a firm believer that it should not be just because of your offensive numbers. It should that your defense should come into play, which is why he supports Bobby Witt. Not that Aaron Judge is bad defensively. He's not. It's, but Bobby Wood is sensational. Francisco Lindor is also a sensational shortstop. Well, so Otani's minus 2,500, right, to win the, yeah. the MVP. He's going to win it. He was big again last night for the for the Dodgers in a game that, you know, it's a four-game series, but they would have gone down 3-0 in that one. Um, yeah. if, if it was not Shohei Otani doing this, it was another DH who was about to have this 50-50 season, which, like, Major League Baseball and ESPN very much wants you to know that that's happening. Uh, They are very like narrative driven on that front. If it were anyone else, but other than Shohei Otani, would we still have him as the slam dunk MVP or is it the, is it the character here that's helping? I I think it's, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think it's a lot of name, you know, and, and the, and the league pushing it. And, and this is what, and again, and like I said, you can have this conversation with Anthony, but he is of the mindset that war the calculations for war have not been readjusted to justify all the stolen bases that are happening in baseball since they, 
since the last two years. So that, in, in other words, guys are getting so much more credit on their war because they have these higher stolen base totals that hasn't been the, the formula hasn't been recalculated to, to recognize that steals are up like through the roof in the sport for the last two years. And he might be right about that. I don't, I don't know. I, I, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not the math whiz that he is. Um, so maybe, like I said, he'll maybe he'll bring the homework for you, Bob, and he'll explain why that is. But uh, yeah, I, I still have a hard time finding another player in the National League that's more deserving than Otani this year. Yeah, and and I think that the hype machine is through the roof for him, and I, I I've complained about that on the in the past. But it's like show. also when you deliver on hype, like when you come off yes. and like last night, if you just watch a game last night, and I know a lot of Phillies fans might have, and the NFL was on too, but like. They're kind of dead last night, the Dodgers. You're like, they, they give yeah. up the two runs early, and you're like, they're, they're going to lose again to this Braves team. And it's Otani that gets them going, you know, yeah. with, with two big hits. So, yeah. I, you know, I, I have a hard time. And I, I have a hard time, too, for a guy. You know, Lindor has 31 homers. I know he plays shortstop. His OPS plus 137. Like, I, I, I get it. Like, I, I understand the season that he's had. He's going to have 40 doubles. He's probably going to finish with 35 homers. He's going to carry, and he carried the Mets. And he carried the Mets. Like, the Mets aren't that good, you know. Play 270. Like, he's got an 834 OPS. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Mm. I, like, I, I like I look at Lindor and I say, how is his season any different than Bryce Harper? And oh, we're not talking about Bryce. And we're, not, and we're not talking about Bryce Harper as an MVP candidate. Yeah, well, you know, I, I actually – one of my predictions is Bryce Harper is going to win an MVP this season. And I'm a little bit disappointed. And I know that he battled some injuries and stuff like that, but I actually thought the door was open for him to, to do it this year. Um, yeah. If Bryce Harper's sitting on 38 home runs right now and his OPS is sitting there at 979, 80, I might be banging the drum for Bryce Harper. Uh, but, you know, he went 35 days without homering and, you know, he's, he's going to end up with what, probably 45, 50, not 50, but 45 doubles. He's well, is, it 40 or, is it 40 already? 40 on the nose. He's, I don't I don't see 10 more doubles in 13 games, but maybe 30 home runs, 45 doubles, let's say. I mean, that's a, a really good season. He's going to have an yeah. OPS north of 900 likely. He's probably going to hit 285 or better. I mean, it's a really good year. I just, I thought we were going to get like his, I thought we were going to get his best year this season. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that the injuries kind of derailed him a little bit. Uh, um, uh, you know, for whatever reason, um, he also, I, I, no one's written this yet, Bob, but I noticed this on Saturday and I probably should have said something, but I thought maybe it was just a one-off. And then I saw it again yesterday and I was, I was off yesterday, so I didn't write, but the last two games, he not wearing the big bulky left elbow sleeve. Yeah. So maybe he's feeling better. Maybe he's feeling and better. Here comes the run. Here comes the run. Yeah. I mean, he finishes what fourth or fifth in MVP voting, but then blitzes the playoffs and wins a World Series MVP. And I think we're all all right with that, right? Probably. Yeah, I think everybody Probably. would be okay with that. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, for Anthony Sanfilippo, I'm looking forward to I, I have not seen you in a while, by the way. So I have, yes. you know, I know you're going to be a busy guy this weekend, but I'll get to see you. I'm looking forward to the wedding. Uh, you know, in advance, congratulations. Uh, thank should be you, thank fun. You. I'll be the guy that's, uh, 14 drinks deep. We don't have the kids that night. So we're going to, you know, we're going to enjoy it. We're going to make it's, it count. It's close to your house, man. It is like close. Can, uh, but, you know, we'll, you we'll make sure that we we'll stay safe there. Yeah. yeah you we'll, can probably Uber it from there. We will, we will make sure that we uh, have the ride situation handled, promote the responsible thing there. Yeah, uh, but yeah, man, look, I'm looking forward to it. Obviously, super excited. Congrats to you. Um, Thank you. For Anthony Sanfilippo, I'm Bob Wankel. I'll be back later this week with Anthony Jr. And uh, we will talk to you soon.